this is Bob Sarantino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and um, I have a very special guest today, Connie Knox from Genealogy TV. So welcome, Connie. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Oh, my pleasure. I'm delighted to have you because I think you, you do great work, um, and it's going to really be an advantage to uh, my listeners, especially those who are just starting out and, and doing their genealogy research. Um, but before we talk about Genealogy TV, um, let's talk a little bit about your background and why you got started in genealogy in the first place. Oh, my goodness. I've been doing genealogy since I was a toddler, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about toddler. Well, the earliest memory I have was when I was about six years old. I was sitting with my great grandmother and my mother uh, looking at old photographs. And uh, I think that's kind of where it started because I was like, oh, this is cool. My mom's like pointing things out. She's going, this was, these guys are from Denmark and these guys are, you know, and I'm like, oh, you know, and this great grandmother that I was sitting with, this is the only memory I have of her because she died not long after that, but uh, she was born in Denmark. And so uh, then my grandmother, her daughter uh, was telling me about them coming across the country in a covered wagon and that was, I was hooked at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so that was as a teenager when I was about 15. So that's when I really got into it. I still have the old little spiral notebooks where, you know, bad handwriting and horrible spelling and all <laughs> that I have from that. So yeah, that's when I got started and I've been doing, I call myself a lifelong genealogist. Um, I have been doing genealogy ever since. And, um, and then Along the way, you know, you got to make money. So, um, and my love is video. And so I went into television broadcasting as a young adult and was I worked 40 plus years in television broadcasting and ultimately owned a TV station, then sold the TV station and became the manager of that TV station as a CBS affiliate for the last um, 20 some years of my career. And then but I started in public broadcasting. So I always say I went from PBS to CBS. <laughs> and so then when I left broadcasting, I kind of crossed over for a couple of years. I started the YouTube channel because it just made sense, right? I'm a genealogist at heart. I love doing video. I love teaching. I love the education part of it. And it was just a marriage made in heaven. I love this job because I get to take uh, the genealogy side of it and, and, and my experience there, and then marry that with what I try to do, good quality video and educational process on the YouTube channel and on the videos for the Academy. So I opened the Academy um, in March of last year. So actually, it's probably like the anniversary right now. I don't really know exactly the date, but it was March of last year. Oh, no, this is April. So we're past that. Okay. So anyway, that's where I'm at. So I've got the YouTube channel and I've got the uh, academy now and and things are rocking and rolling it's the youtube channel is doing quite well yeah i i noticed that that's that's great and then, you know i i didn't start way back when when you did but i grew up the same way i always liked history um was one of my better subjects in school algebra not so much uh, but i i used to enjoy sitting down with you know the old photo album with the the black pages in the little corners and, you know, ask my mother, who's that and where did they come from? Um, but now your past is interesting because uh, what year was that when they, when the, when they were in the covered wagon? I don't know. And, you know, I've, I've often, I think my grandmother liked to embellish stories once in a while. <laughs> well, so I that's think un, that's what happened unusual. was my grandmother immigrated when she was two years old. I think that was 1882. And so I think what happened was they came in, I believe they came in through New York and uh, they made their way to Wyoming. So I, you know, somewhere in there, they had to have gone by covered wagon mm -hmm. or wagon or horse or by foot or train um, to get to Wyoming. And I, th I actually think um, that they may have done part of that trip by train. Um, because the trains were already coming through Laramie at that time. So I don't know, uh, you know, <laughs> and then I do know they ended up migrating by car <laughs> to uh, Long Beach, California. So now, so 
Do you know why they went to Wyoming? Was it just for land or? Uh, you know, I suspect it was, you know, so they're Danish, this, this yeah. clan that we're talking about. And uh, I met up through Facebook and there's a tip for, especially for beginners is to find a Facebook group for the areas in which you're researching. So in my case, I was on a Danish uh, Facebook group and I actually ran into a DNA cousin. We actually met and then found the face, found each other again on Facebook. But this DNA cousin, born and raised in Denmark, he's like a fourth or fifth cousin of mine. And uh, I asked him because I said, why were people leaving Denmark? And he explained, and as in a lot of the countries, uh, you know, the European countries and all of those countries, a lot of them, what the, the, the standard was is that the oldest son inherited the farm. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. my ancestors were younger, like the, the great grandfather that ultimately married my grand, great grandmother that we were talking about. He migrated because of land he was the youngest son and he was not land is running out at this time in history and you know they can't really subdivide a small farm amongst four boys because they're not going to have enough land to farm so you know the younger sons often are the ones that immigrated to the united states and uh so that's exactly what i believe happened in my family and so uh you know the stories of the land of riches and ultimate un, um, what unlimited amount of land, right? And so at that time, you know, the great frontier was being explored and lots and lots of, you know, land available and some of it really fertile, rich land. And these guys, a lot of them knew how to farm. Some of them were, you know, shoemakers and we needed everything, right? They, we, they needed iron workers and they needed everybody. Um, so it was an opportunity for anybody um, to make their way to America. So that's that's kind of my Danish ancestry side of the family. Yeah, and that's a great story because, you know, when you think of uh, immigration to the U.S., Danish doesn't pop into you. <laughs> it's not the first country that pops into your, to your mind. <laughs> well, especially for you since you're doing Italian ancestry right but it just depends i've got a whole other line from england and you know so it just kind of depends we've got scottish and irish and all kinds mm -hmm. of folks coming over you know uh from from different lands and african americans coming from the south and i mean it's just we just it, america i'm actually watching i'm re-watching because i it's been years since i watched it on youtube gotta love youtube um, on YouTube is the History Channel, and I'm rewatching the whole series on American history, and it's fascinating. God, they did a really good job on this series. Yeah, and to your point about England, you know, my children, uh, they're both adopted. Um, and um, our son, we all did the DNA, and our son turned out to be a fifth cousin of my wife from Puerto Rico. What? <laughs> Isn't wow. <that> wild? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Uh, that is crazy. And and my my daughter, um, she goes back. Uh, her birth parents, both sides of her birth parents, came here in late 1600s, early 1700s, and um, I was able to trace her back to the dispensers. Uh, she's a distant, distant, distant dispenser cousin. Uh, so you know. It's interesting when you do, a lot of people don't want to do the DNA, but you can find out some really interesting things like, you know, your your son is your fifth cousin. <laughs> well, now that I've gotten more of my tree built out, although I'm, you know, still working on mine as well, um, watching that History Channel um, series again about America and the, you know, the growth of them, you look at it in a completely different way. You start looking at the different branches of your tree and you start going, oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. That is, you know, it's kind of like you can relate, you know, to the people that you're seeing in this and the founding reasons and, you know, the Declaration of Independence and all that, you know, it just makes you feel good anyway. Well, yeah. And, it, you know, you could go someplace and say, wow, my ancestor was there. 
Um, so let's talk about genealogy TV. Okay. Um, I, there's so, I, you know, I was looking at it and there's so many facets of it. So rather than me try to explain it, why don't you tell everybody what's available on there and what they could they could do with genealogy TV? Sure. So if you're a beginner at genealogy TV, I mean beginner at genealogy, the genealogy TV YouTube channel has a series for beginners, and it's I did before I ever launched before I ever launched the uh, video the first video I did twelve episodes. And they're all getting started and they're in series. So it's kind of like, you know, basically it's kind of like what rocks your world is episode one. What, what are you curious about? And that, because that's what drives everything that you do in genealogy. And so as you start getting farther into uh, genealogy, you start hearing the words research question a lot, but that basically that's the curiosity part. What is your research question? What is it you want to know? And then it goes into, uh, starts the foundation of building skills. So really what Genealogy TV does is it is really skill-based. There are a few individual, like I do have one on Italian research. I have one on, you know, a few specific countries, but for the most part, it's how to do research. And there's so many different assets of aspects of how to do research. Like how to take good research notes. I'm probably the queen of research notes because I keep telling everybody uh, research notes is where it's at. And I could talk about that for an hour um, and how to do research, how to find the records, how to, um, if you are lost and you go, I need to find a so-and-so kind of record, where do I go? All of that kind of stuff is on genealogy TV, how to do DNA, how to use ancestry. I love ancestry. Um, I love the platform. So there's probably more ancestry videos on there than any other platform, but I do have my heritage, family search. I have a lot on family search, you know, a little bit on find my past. Um, there's just, um, you know, kind of a, a variety of stuff up there. I don't get into the real deep uh, genetic genealogy stuff. Basically what my goal is and my, and my tagline is to help you go further faster and factually, which I'm very big on the factual part, um, but how to verify those records, how to make sure that the link and the branch of the tree that you're, you're going down is actually accurate. So that's kind of what Genealogy TV is all about. And um, about halfway through, so I started that in the summer of 2018, and about halfway through 2020, I started creating handouts for the channel members. Um, and so they have to be at the information access level. Just so like 10 bucks a month, you get all the handouts um, that go with the videos. Not every video has a handout. For example, if I was doing an interview like you and I are doing today, there wouldn't be a handout for that. But um, if I'm showing you step-by-step -step instructions on how to group your DNA matches, on Ancestry, there's a handout for that. Uh, people love the handouts. So um, that's kind of why I started doing the handouts because I kept getting requests for them. That's Genealogy TV. That, no, that's, that's uh, great information. And um, so let me ask you, what are, the, what are the top three mistakes that people make when they're starting out genealogy? Oh, that's a good one. Okay, number one is importing from other trees without verification. That's probably the biggest mistake I see. So people are in a hurry to trace their family back to Italy or wherever, and uh, they go, oh, 10 people said that, that that person is in my family tree. That must be true. Import, ching, 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 ching. They just hit click, 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 and they hit import. Um, so please don't do that. <laughs> please verify the records go look and make your own decision so when we're looking at other member trees what we really want to do is go show me the money show me the records where's your proof go find the sources within the other guy's tree and go okay now i believe you now i'll import it or wait a minute you don't have any sources i am not going to import that 
Now, sometimes a strategy might be to import it, but mark it as unverified with tree tags at Ancestry, if you're using Ancestry, and mark it as unverified so that you can use it, use the algorithms at Ancestry to help find those records. So that might be a different strategy, but I'm just saying don't automatically import um, records from other members' trees. All right, so that's one. Let's see, another one. That's probably the biggest one. The second one, you know, I'm a big believer in keeping research notes. And so people go, Ancestry does that for me. I don't need to be keeping research notes. No, they don't do this for you. And the way I keep research notes is one set of research notes per ancestor. And you keep them in chronological order. So you put the date first and then the item. So it's a date birth certificate. He was born in such, some details. He was born in such and such time, you know, blah, 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 born in a log cabin or whatever you want to write. And a source citation. That's probably the third of the things that people make mistakes is you put a source citation in there. Now I would prefer you go, I found this on, you know, a birth certificate. You know, you want to like use a footnote if you can, but I use footnotes because it makes my notes clean, but you don't have to. It's a whole conversation on how to do footnotes. But you at least put something in there. Where you found it, when you found it. I like the, the five W's, right? Who, what, where, when, why, and how. Who it is, what it is, where it is, when it was, and how or why it matters in your family history research. Those are the kind of things that that's quick and dirty. If you really want the building blocks for a good source citation, it's who, what it is, when and when, two whens, when it was found and when the document was created, where and where, two wheres, where the document was and where you found it. So maybe you found it on find a grave, but the document came from Italy. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yep. So, yeah. so, and then, and then why it matters. So why really is not part of a professional source citation but I like to include that information in the notes because it's like this document ties ancestor number one to ancestor number two, and it proves whatever. That's why. So if you have all that information in your research notes, and that was just a birth certificate. So let's move on you know, <laughs> to the marriage certificate or the residence or whatever. So you keep everything in chronological order. And the reason you do this is because a you can put more detail into it than you could possibly put on ancestry you can format it in the way you want to put it and you can then go okay what am i missing wait a minute there's this big 20 year gap between 1880 and 1900 what am i going to do to find something where was this person we were here at, in, in place number one and now we're in place number two how did he get from point a to point b so now we got this 20 year gap. We need to go do some research. Maybe we find it in city directories or we find it in tax records or we find it in whatever. And so research notes, you know, this is, this is an interesting point because I was at Roots Tech a month ago, whenever Roots Tech was two months ago, maybe now. And um, I ran into three different people who said they've been following me on the YouTube channel and they started keeping research notes because they know how much I harp on it. And they said, oh my gosh, it has changed the way I research. It has changed my world. I have broken down brick walls. I have found things I never saw before. And one of the other things, one of the other reasons why I talk about research notes so much is because um, what I do, and I use my microphone to do this, I go into Word and I'll look at a census record, for example. Census is easy, right? And I'll go, okay, John Doe, he's a white male. I'm talking, I'm dictating into Word mm -hmm. everything I'm seeing. John Doe, he's a white male. He's 21 years old. He's single. You know, he's a farmer. He's His mother was born in such and such and his father was born in such and such. And I'm reading all this into my, because I don't want to type that much, right? but it's getting into my research notes. Now I can go back and clean up the little nuances that dictation didn't get right, but now just speaking it out loud, oh my gosh, you pay attention to details you never noticed before. You go, oh, wait a minute, he owns land. 
I need to go find the land records. Let me go see if I can find the deeds. Doing this stuff in your research notes, I'm telling you, will revolutionize the way you do research. Yeah, that's fantastic. I didn't, I never thought of that. And also, especially just, you know, speaking it, you know, because everybody has a tendency, at least I do anyway, has a tendency to start typing Skim. stuff. But I think you're right. As you're speaking it, you, you know, think it, it changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. You know what I do? I have this book I'm working on right now. This is not my book, but my ancestors are all over in this book. And so what I do is when I find that chapter that's on that person, so this is the book for Charles Booth and Descendants, and I will actually dictate into my research notes the paragraph out of this book because how many times do we skim? We skim a book for surnames. We're looking for, <laughs> we're like, where's my ancestor? I, I don't have time to read all this. I want to just find the ancestor. But when you stop and you read that paragraph out loud, then you go, oh my gosh, this little detail I never noticed before. And now I can go see if I can find that record. And, and this past weekend, I discovered a um, land bounty record for a widow um, where the, the widow had gone and uh, went to look for bounty record or went to apply for bounty records like 30 years after her husband died. Um, he had served in the War of 1812, and I didn't know that. News to me. So, you know, again, it's one of those things that when you write those research notes, and especially if you read it into your, uh, you know, dictate it using a little, there's a microphone usually on the top. If you're using Word, there's a microphone up there, but just about everything has dictation now. So, yeah, yeah and it's really it's, gotten it's... quite good. And so now a lot of people, I, I get a lot of posts on my group. Uh, I want to research, but I don't know where to start. Okay. So Start with yourself. <laughs> right? I mean, that sounds stupid. People don't want to, like, I'm looking for my ancestors. I don't want to talk about myself. Yes, you do. So what you do is you go either, either get, if, if you can afford to buy an, a, a subscription to Ancestry, then that's what I would recommend. But I would start with, you can get a free account at Ancestry and then decide to pay for it later if you want. You can, there is, there's a difference. There's a difference between a guest account and a, a free trial. So if you don't want to pay for it, use the guest account and just Google it. You can find it. Go, you know, free guest account at Ancestry and you'll get a link to it. But you sign up for Ancestry and just get the free account to start and start building your tree. You won't be able to search records under a free account, but you could certainly um, go over to familysearch.org and search for the same people over there and look for records over there. Now, they are fabulous for records over at Family Search, but they don't have quite as many as Ancestry does. Um, so the other thing you can do also is the free trial. Now, one thing you need to know is if you're just experimenting and you're just getting started and you go, I don't know if I really want to invest in this, you could do a free trial and then turn it off. Your ancestors will still stay there. Your account will still stay there even if you stop paying for it. So don't think you have to delete the account or delete the tree. And then maybe five years later, you decide, I want to pick that up again. You can come back to your same account and pick up where you left off. So just know that, that if you stop paying for it, it doesn't go away on Ancestry. So you, what I profess a lot, though, is to start with yourself, then add your parents, then add your grandparents, but don't go too fast. Get everything you can on each person before you step backwards. Everything. Look for everything. So also go look at wikitree.com and because some of your ancestors may be there. And that's a collaborative tree similar to Family Search. So Family Search is a collaborative tree as well. One of the reasons why I say use Ancestry to build your tree, even if it's a free tree, because you have control over that tree. Whereas at Family Search, it's a collaborative tree. Everybody's working on it, and they may change things that you don't agree with. So um, just be mindful of that. Wikitree does the same thing, but the Wikitree has a little bit of an advantage, in my opinion, in that you cannot add an ancestor to the Wikitree without some sort of record or verification of the next link back. So 
The cool part about Wikitree is if you start something at Wikitree, which is free too, if you start something on Wikitree and you start building a tree, but you don't, you haven't connected to the World Collaborative Tree, once you do, it ripples all of mm -hmm. these ancestors back, um, you know, from what people have done uh, previously. Same thing at Family Search too. Um, you may not be in the Family Search tree yet, um, but as you start to uh, build it out, you might they they might be suggesting, hey. You know, there's already a person in the tree that looks like this person that you're getting ready to add. Go investigate, and you might be able to just connect to that person instead of creating a duplicate. They're trying really hard. Everybody's trying really hard yeah. um, to not have duplicate ancestors. You, you know, and I've used WikiTree before, but I never thought – I never populated myself or my family like that. I, I'm going to have to look into that. They... Yeah, it's – um. I would say it's not the most user friendly. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> site. It's because it just is very busy. But once you kind of, there's a video on, on genealogy TV on how to get started on WikiTree, and I've got another one with some updates coming out. I don't know when, in a few weeks. Um, but the um, WikiTree has some really unique properties, and one of the things that it has that nobody else has is it has this fan chart. So it's similar to the way Family Search looks with the fan chart. But one of the cool things about it is if you turn on um, colorize repeats is what it's called, it will colorize anybody that you have in your tree that is duplicated in different branches. For example, my great grandparents were second cousins when they married. That means two more generations mm -hmm. back they have the same great grand or same same grandparents, great grandparents. I can't remember exactly how it works in my tree, but there's like when I hit the seventh generation, there's the same same people in the tree in two different branches. So it colorizes those, and nobody else has that. And I didn't know it for the longest time because I was working on ancestry all the time, and an ancestry doesn't have the fan chart. It has, the, you know, the pedigree chart. And so unless you drill in, because for me, it's the seventh generation back. So unless you drill into one back to the seventh generation and happen to hit the other line and go, wait a minute, I thought I just saw that guy on the other. And it took me a while to figure that out. Um, I just hadn't noticed it before because there's no way to to notice um, duplicating people in your tree. Yeah, that's that's neat. I'm going to have to, I'm gonna, well, first I'm going to watch it on, genealogy tv and learn how to do it and then i'm gonna i'm gonna do it uh and i have an interesting thing in in my grandmother's family when i was researching um i found a cousin on uh, facebook uh piomalo and that's a very unique name in italy because they originally were from spain mm -hmm. and um she was researching and i said we must be in the same family but what i found was that my great grandparents, when I when I found their chart or their ancestry lineage on this Libra de Oro, mm -hmm. um, just above them, I found out there was a Piramalo that married a Caracciolo. And then there's my great grandparents, Piramalo and Caracciolo. And what happened was the my great grandparents, their aunt and uncle. Her, her aunt married his uncle the generation before. Uh, and so my cousin that I found in Italy were cousins from both families. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's weird. So, yeah, you uh, can have multiple relationships to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And But, you know, you start thinking about, you start, you know, when you find something like that, at least I do, you start thinking about, well, how did they meet? You know, did they, yeah. maybe they met at a party. Maybe the yep. the yep. families introduced them. It it you know your mind starts going in all these different directions because there had to be some sort of connection, uh, yeah. to do that. Um, so that's a good tip for the beginners though too, because one of the things that you need to do when you're trying to figure out that kind of problem is right place, right time, right? right. You got to be thinking, okay, you know I had this. My mother was adopted, for example, so I was always trying to figure out. When I was trying to figure out her biological family, I was like, all right, who was in the right place at the right time, right? 
how did these two get together? How do they know each other? You know, yeah. and this was from Los Angeles, California. It was a big place even back then. So it's kind of like, you know, how, there's got to be a, a nexus somewhere. You know, it's it's a fun little fun little thing to try and figure out, especially well, yeah. when all you have is records. You know, well, yeah, and that that happened with with um, the next the next generation of my second great grandparents. I found that my second great grandmother was Elisa Moore from Switzerland, from Lucerne, Switzerland, and she was living in Naples, married an Italian, and I was thinking to myself, well, why was this woman in Naples, this Swiss woman in Naples, and I figured. I'm never going to find this out. I'm never going to figure this out. Well, I was out there one day just Googling around, and I found the records for the Italian, of not the Italian, it was in Italy yet, for the Neapolitan army in the 1850s. And I found a Bernardo Moore captain in the Swiss Guard in Naples. Uh, and th and this, this book had the uh, the officers in the Italian, uh, or the I keep saying Italian, the Neapolitan army. And then just below him, I found a lieutenant, Filippo Caracciolo, who was my second great grandfather. So again, well, he was a captain. He had a young daughter. He was a lieutenant. And that's how they wound up getting married. To take it the next, next step forward, uh, I went out there one day and I said, give me the records for Lucerne, anything on Lucerne. And I found a website, and they said, if you write us in English, German, or Italian about ancestry records, we'll, we'll answer. So I said, my grandmother, my great-grandmother was Elisa Moore. Her father was Bernardo. They sent me the link to the, um, the ancestry charts for Lucerne going back to the 1500s, all handwritten. Nice. And I found her and I found him and I was able to trace their families all the way back to the 1500s. Nice. So, so uh, you know, another tip for the beginners is, you know, the friends, associates and neighbors. In your case, you found somebody on the same record. We always want to look at everybody, including the witnesses. This is a big mm -hmm. deal. Witnesses are often family members. So uh, we want to look, I, I document it all. I transcribe those records. I, you know, even the justice of the peace and all of those people, because if we research the family, not only, not only the, the, what I call the target ancestor, the person that I want to learn more about is my target ancestor, but I want to also research his or her siblings, spouses, children, everybody. I want to research them all. So that's the family, but also the friends, associates, and neighbors. We would call that the fan club, right? So we want to research the fan club because a lot of times it's those neighbors that help us tie one record to another. So for those who are just getting started, this is a huge deal because if you're going from say the 1880 census and now you're stepping backwards, you're always working backwards, you now stepping back to the 1870 census. How do you know the guy in the 1870 census is your guy? Right? Right. So you have to look at the family. Well, what if the family has moved on? The kids have grown and they're now out of the house and they've married off. And how do you know this is your guy? Look at the neighbors, because if they haven't moved, then a lot of times you're going to see the Robinsons next door and you're going to see the Joneses on the other side. And what I do is I extract that data for five to 10 pages, depending on, on what I'm doing. I extract that data. I put it into Excel spreadsheet. There's a whole lesson on the YouTube channel about how to do this, but I'll extract five or 10 pages on either side of my ancestor and look and then search, because if you put it in Excel, you can search for it, search for surnames of other family members. And I almost always find them it's super easy. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so one one last thing I'd like to ask you is how do you use social media, Facebook to research people in your family? So Facebook is where most of the genealogists are. There's, there, there's a growing group of them on Instagram, but I think as much as I'm not super crazy about the Facebook <laughs> platform, it's oh, the too. best we have for genealogists and social media. So 
what you can do is you can go up there and search whatever you're interested in, but always put the word genealogy after it because it's almost always going to be in the title of a group. So if you are doing Italian genealogy, search for that and see if you can find some groups to join. You can also search surnames. So I have three or four that I created. So I have the Henley surname group. I have the Madsen Jensen surname group. Those are the folks from Denmark. You know, I have the Booth Simmons surname group and you can make them private or you can make them public. But if you search them and you find them and if they're private, just ask if you can join them. And a lot of times there's a little description in there, too. It'll say uh, this is a private group just for my immediate family. So bug off <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the descriptions in there that says, you know, this is um, the Henleys from Texas, which is not my clan. But I actually joined that group because we are connected. I figured out the connection between the North Carolina Henleys and the Texas Henleys. There is actually one or two links that are kind of remote, but ultimately we're all cousins, right? So, um, you know, you can then post these little stories. This is what I like to do. So I'm doing my research and I go, oh, this is interesting. The family might be interested in this. I'll grab that picture. Images sell, by the way. You've got to have an image, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. even if it's a map. Um, and we could talk about maps too, but map or an image of the ancestor or whatever, and just two or three paragraphs. And then put it up on your Facebook group. And boy, you will get some reactions from the family members that have joined that group because they're interested, right? And they they may copy that. But here's the clue about that. Write it offline first because you want to preserve that story in your family records you do not want to just write it in facebook and then let's say tomorrow facebook blows up and that family history is gone so write it offline then copy and paste it into the facebook group um, and that way you preserve that history because that little snippet that little three or four paragraphs maybe it's more might become a little chapter in your next book mm -hmm. so yeah uh, as well as your research notes, by the way. So you could, if you're really interested in creating a book, um, start using those little snippets. And then over time, you have so much material, you could publish it. Well, yeah. And, and you know, I think whether you whether you write the book for your family, or you write it to publish it. Um, that's one thing that I find very important. And I, I tell people all the time, especially, you know, for those of us who are Italian, you, you can't lose those stories, especially from the old country. Um, you know, we're into the fourth or fifth generations here. And a lot of the things that I knew growing up, growing up are gone. And unless you write yeah. them down and preserve them, and the same thing with the photographs. Yeah. One more point about social media, and I've done this so many times, is I've inherited a bunch of photographs that I don't know who these people are. I know which branch they come from. <laughs> yeah. But I will put that photograph up on Facebook and go, hey, does anybody know who this person is? Like, this really only works on Facebook groups. You wouldn't want to just like, I don't know, maybe you put it out on your public feed, but my friends don't care about genealogy. <laughs> so I put <laughs> I it up on the family well. <laughs> Facebook group, right? The genealogy groups. And I'll go, who is this person? And inevitably, somebody has piped back and go, oh, that's Aunt Lorraine. Oh, really? What's Aunt Lorraine's full name? We're checking back and forth with you with each other and sure enough then i can be able to identify that photograph um just a little tidbit on ancestry i was having an interview with krista cowan from ancestry the other day and i had posed this idea about a reverse lookup of images now you can do this on google but ancestry would be great and i said what if you could take a photograph and upload it to facebook an unidentified ancestor and then what if some distant cousin has uploaded that same photograph with identification. What if we could marry those together? Like Ancestry goes, oh, this image is the same as this image. And this one's identified. Bingo. I think they're working on that. I think uh, that would be like fabulous. that idea. So that be, I don't know. We'll see. That would be fantastic. And I, I interviewed uh, Kate Kelly, uh, I guess about a month ago now. Um, and she's the photo angel and she goes she goes to uh all of these antique places and finds old photographs and then reunites them with their family I, that is, does the research yeah that's that fun. is just 
I mean, it's just amazing that she that she does this. She's such a sweet person. I did uh, that here locally with a marriage record they found in a thrift shop. Another episode on the YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, that it's fun. This yeah. marriage record, I think, was from the mid late 1800s. And it was found inside of a Bible or something. I forget what it was. It was, it was, or it was behind a picture frame. That's what it was. They found it behind a picture frame and they, they didn't know anything about it. And so I was able to um, do the research, find the woman and reached out to her through Facebook <laughs> and said, Hey, is this your ancestor? And she's like, Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> and she got so excited. It was a really good episode. I ha I have the, the marriage. I guess it's more of an announcement than a marriage record from my uh, my great great grandfather's on my father's side, uh, Achilles Sorrentino, uh, and his wife was Julia Princey, and um, it's thirty four pages long, and I was like, why is this thing thirty four pages long? And her father was an attorney in Italy in the eighteen. 60s or whatever it was 1840s <laughs> it's this humongous thing that's got everything in the kitchen sink in there <laughs> it's it's in, it's an incredible record um cool that's you so, know it's like wills wills have yeah. so much information in them yeah and i and i found i found that from a fourth grade grandparent in italy and it was it wasn't necessarily will it's the challenge to a will look for probate records even if you don't think your ancestor wrote a will even if they're like illiterate, look for probate records because if they owned land, there's a probate package out there somewhere, probably, and probably at the state archives. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a that's a good point. Um, so before we go, uh, how do people find you? How do they find Genealogy TV? YouTube.com forward slash Genealogy TV, or you can go to GenealogyTV.org. Um, and that's the website. And then the Academy is genealogytv.org forward slash Academy. So. Well, that's fantastic. And yeah. great insight for anybody beginning. Uh, check out Genealogy TV. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time, Connie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Bob Sorrentino. Just letting you know that my new book, Farmers and Nobles, is now available for sale on www.italiangenealogy.blog backslash farmers and nobles, or you can find the link in the podcast notes. Thanks for listening.